So, welcome everybody. So, here we are with another English language A-level video. Now, this one uh, is, I've really designed this for second years doing revision about um, grammar. So, uh, the focus on this is about sentences and hopefully by the end of this I can convince you that there is actually something interesting and meaningful to say about sentencing and that, you know, it's not just about feature spotting, but you can connect what you say about sentencing to meanings and representations. Okay, so let's dive straight in there. Are the following sentences standard or non-standard? Having a great time in red car. <clears throat> it's probably the first time that you've ever heard anybody say that sentence. Having a great time in red car. Standard or non-standard? Mexico. Although the rain was beating hard against the window pane. It's Friday. I'm hungry. When does this lesson end? I've heard that one before. Okay, so let's go back to these. Having a great time in red car, standard or non-standard? Answer, non-standard. And it's non-standard because it's elliptical. We have the omission of the, uh, the pronoun at the beginning, as in I. So... And we also have the omission of the primary auxiliary verb, to be. So it's the kind of thing that people say, or it's the kind of thing that people write in note form, but it's non-standard. Mexico, clearly non-standard, not a verb in sight. Third one, although the rain was beating hard against the window pane, what? Yeah, this is non-standard too, because this is a subordinate clause because it's introduced with this word although, which is a subordinating connective, it means that, um, you know, this is a sentence that, to be standard English, it needs a main clause that comes after this. Okay, so that makes it a minor non-standard sentence. And what about this one? It's Friday, I'm hungry, when does this lesson end? Well, there's your comma splicing going on there, because actually you've got three perfectly reasonable sentences, but unfortunately, They've been connected together with commas, making it non-standard. Okay, so it begs the question, what exactly is a sentence? So what I'd like you to do is to write a dictionary definition of the word sentence. Stop the video there. Have you done it? Okay, so here's sentence. That's how uh, it would be written in the IPA, the International Phonetic Alphabet. Uh, notice it's got one of those funny upside down E's. That's the schwa sound. That's the uh sound sentence. It's a noun in terms of its word class. That's the plural form. We just put an S inflection on the end. And here's a definition. So a group of words containing a subject and a verb that expresses a thought in the form of statement, question, instruction, or excla exclamation, and starts with a capital letter when written. And there's a little bit of etymology that I've thrown in there as well. So uh, it comes into English in the medieval period, uh, in the Middle English period. So that's kind of from 1100 to 1500, the Middle English period. And it came into English from French like so many words, David Crystal reckons that something like 10,000 words came into English in the medieval period from French. So it comes into English from Old French, and the French, of course, nicked it from the Romans. That's from Latin, sententia, meaning an opinion. And that came from the verb sentire, to feel or to be of the opinion. So what that demonstrates, if, if nothing else, is the circuitous route that lots of words undertake in order to come into English. Latin, Old French, Middle English, current day English. Okay, so there's our definition of the word sentence. Right, so what we're going to do now is we're going to think about different sentence types. There's all sorts of things to say about sentences. There's uh, sentence types, there's sentence functions. Uh, you could also make comments about sentence length as well. So let's start off with sentence types or sentence construction. Um, so first of all, we have minor sentences. Um, so these are words like, or sentences like, be quiet, goodbye, sounds good. All of those are elliptical 
so they're missing something uh, so a minor sentence therefore doesn't have either a subject by which i mean not a topic but an agent that does the verb so minor sentences don't have a subject and they don't have a main verb as well okay so the more minor sentences that you've got in a text obviously the lower the level of formality at this point it's good to throw in yaus uh, who came up in the 1960s with his ideas of the five levels of formality. So if you've got a text with lots of minor sentences in, then that might mean that the text is a kind of casual level of formality, which is the fourth level down uh, underneath consultative. It might even be intimate. Uh, second uh, sentence type are simple sentences. Now, what to constitutes a simple sentence? It's got to have a subject and it's got to have a main verb and it should express a complete thought. So here we've got three simple sentences. The snow falls, I love you, my auntie has green eyes. That would make a great piece of existential French poetry. The snow falls, I love you, my auntie has green eyes. Each one of those is a simple sentence. So I love you, there you've got the subject I, You've got the verb love, who is doing the uh, doing the loving. And then you've got you, which is an object in here. Okay, so, so far we've got minor sentences and we've got simple sentences. Things now get more complicated because we have compound sentences. Now, a compound sentence is an independent clause that's linked to another independent clause by a so-called coordinating conjunction or connective. So here's your example. I drove to Manchester. There's an independent clause. And then I took the train to Liverpool is another independent clause. And they're kind of being glued together by the coordinating connective there and. So other uh, popular connective, coordinating connectives are things like then and so. Uh, we then have complex sentences. Now, a complex sentences consists of main clause and a subordinate clause. So the subordinating connective connects the clause together. So look at this sentence. The workers left the building when they heard. Okay, so the main clause here is the workers left the building. So we've got the subject and the verb there. So that in itself would constitute a complete sentence, like a simple sentence. But we've got this bit tagged on when they heard, which is a subordinate clause. It kind of only makes sense being tagged on to this bit over here. So therefore, when is functioning as a subordinating connective. Okay, so basically more um, formal texts, the higher the register, then the, the greater the likelihood that you're going to be getting complex sentencing. And then, of course, you've got a mixture of the two. You've got compound complex sentences, which are made up of at least two coordinating cl clauses connected by a coordinating connective and at least one subordinate clause. That sounded terribly technical, but as you can see from the example, it's really not that difficult. So some of the children went home early, there's one clause. The others remained, there's another independent clause. So they're being glued together by the coordinating connective. And then this bit over here, because they had no transport, that's a subordinate clause. So because that is a subordinating connective. So again, it's the same thing as what I said on the last one. If you've got a text that's that's full of compound complex sentences, it's uh, asking for cognitively higher demands on the reader. OK, so those are the different types. Now, it's interesting to look at journalism. Some of you, perhaps on your language investigations, which are coming up fairly soon, might be doing this where you're taking a particular story and you're looking at the way that people and events are being represented through language in different newspapers. So on the left hand side here, we've got a broadsheet newspaper like The Times or The Telegraph or The Guardian. And on the right hand side there, we've got a misspelling of tabloid. I've, for some bizarre reason, I've missed out the L. So The Sun or The Daily Mirror or The Daily Mail or The Daily Express. OK, so this is the same story, but it's being represented in different ways. Now, what you need to do is compare the effects of the different sentence types in those two. So have a close read of it, pause the video and try and identify which sentence types you're seeing. OK, 
what you should be seeing is that on the left hand side here you've got quite a lot of complex sentences in fact for my money they are all complex sentences because if you look at the first sentence the scientific community is under the microscope so there we've got a main independent clause we've got the subject the scientific community and then we've got the main verb is so that's the main clause and this bit over here is your subordinate clause it's a subordinating connective over here so it's a complex sentence sentence two this is a very serious ethical issue since it questions the very nature of what it is to be human another complex sentence this is a very serious issue is your main clause and then this bit here is subordinate to that so it's introduced by a subordinating connective and then finally the intention to find new ways of treating hitherto untreatable illnesses is no doubt laudable so there you've got a main clause but the cost to human life will be incalculable there's another main clause okay so that's being connected together by a coordinating connective and then we've got another bit on the end as live embryos will be destroyed after 14 days so that's a subordinating uh, clause there so what you've got there is a compound complex uh, sentence so basically this level lifts the level of register it enables the journalists to deal with nuances and complexity in terms of subject matter so you know it's not just to do with the vocabulary the lexis that's being used but it's also to do with the the structures in which the vocabulary is housed compare and contrast with the tabloid newspaper which says mad scientists are on the verge of creating monsters simple sentence so subject there mad scientists main verb are and then that's an adverbial so you've got simple sentence sentence number two they will take the sperm and eggs of human and animals and mix them up so here we've got a compound sentence because we've got this first bit up to animals we've got a coordinating connective and then we've got another clause and then finally living embryos will be trashed after 14 days is another simple sentence albeit it's got a passive voice verb in there what that does is it gives a more direct style okay because tabloid newspapers have to take quite complicated information and they have to make sure that uh, the register is okay for their implied reader so it kind of breaks down some uh, complicated information and the simple sentences are a good way of doing it okay right on to the next bit then let's think about sentence functions what can you do with a sentence now you should know this so just write down on a piece of paper what are the four different things that you can do with an english sentence answer number one declarative sentences so these are statements so they're things like this summer was the hottest on record or i don't like whoever would say that i don't like cheese so these are statements they give information uh, they're not necessarily factual you know uh, they could be an opinionative uh, statement so just because a text is full of declaratives doesn't necessarily mean to say that it's factual or objective quite the opposite we also have imperative sentences now these are giving orders or instructions or advice and directions so they often start with the main verb and they don't have a subject so there'll be things like go left and it's first on your right answer one question from each section there's another spelling mistake what's going on mr english teacher from each section so uh, what's interesting in imperative sentences is the notion of power like if you are able to use imperative sentences to people there may well be like hierarchical power that you've got there in which you're using sort of influential power or instrumental power over the person that you're speaking to uh, that's a joke uh, three interrogatives why has that gone there uh, interrogatives now obviously these ask questions uh, they're formed in all sorts of ways sometimes you invert the verb and the subject you're coming out tonight are you coming out tonight so what are you doing there is you're inverting the second person pronoun and the primary auxiliary verb to be changing them around and that turns it into a question form um, not easy for children to get their heads around uh, interrogatives can start with interrogative pronouns so those are things like who what where when why um, when we looked at CLD speech, it was Ursula Belugi, the researcher, who said that it's usually stage three that children go through where they start to use interrogative pronouns in a standard way. 
And then, of course, you've got tag questions where you've got statements where uh, something is tagged on to the end. Like, it's cold, isn't it? She said she was on her way. Didn't she? Now, tag questions are interesting. There's been tons of research done on English language A-level about tag questions because originally back in the 1970s, there were uh, gender theorists, people like Robin Lakoff, who were saying uh, gen uh, tag questions tend to be used by females and they use it in a kind of submissive way because what they're doing is they're trying to get your agreement. So her opinion was that it was a kind of index of powerlessness. Uh, along came other theories which completely trashed that and said, actually, well, tag questions are not necessarily about powerlessness at all. Uh, and in fact, quite the opposite. So tag questions in themselves are quite interesting question forms and there's lots of research done about them. Uh, the lights have gone off. Next, let me just uh, <clears throat> get that light back on, if I can. There it goes. I'll put some money in the meter. Exclamatives. So exclamatives have an expressive function. So they're conveying force of a statement. And if they're written down, they end with an exclamation mark. So often when you use an exclamative, you're using it either for humor's sake or in order to show shock or surprise. Um, I won't do this anymore. I've often thought about that when I'm teaching English. Well, that was fantastic. Yeah, that's something that students often say when they come out of my lessons. Not. So these are exclamatives. Right, so there are your four sentence functions. Um, now, be warned, sometimes there is a tension between a sentence's grammatical form and its actual function. So compare the functions of the following sentences. So there you are, you're in a classroom. You're sitting next to the door. The door is open. There is a wind blowing through the door. And the teacher says, shut the door. Okay, so that is clearly an imperative. The teacher's got power, so they're telling you what to do. Shut the door. Uh, it's a very direct imperative. Can you shut the door? Now, what's the sentence function there? Well, it looks like a question, doesn't it? Can you shut the door? No, the pragmatic meaning is shut the door, isn't it? So although the, the, uh, the, it looks like an interrogative on the form of it, actually the function of it is pragmatically, it's a request for action. It's telling you to shut the door. The door is open, I say, looking at the student next to the door who's just come in and left it open. So this is a declarative, it's a statement. But again, there's an implied message there, isn't there? Because basically I'm saying, shut that door. And then also I might say, what a terrible draft, which is something I often say when I'm marking students' uh, coursework. That was another joke. What a terrible draft. So again, that's uh, it's something that looks like, uh, it doesn't look like a, uh, an instruction, but it is. Pragmatically, that's an implied instruction even though it just looks like an exclamative. So make the point that there is often a tension between a sentence's grammatical form and its actual function. Okay, what are all these arrows doing? Um, so such is my devotion to the cause that when I was in the toilet the other day, I picked up a, a bleach, a bottle of bleach and started reading the label and found it fascinating in terms of sentence forms. It's the sort of thing we English teachers do. And it read this, contains sodium hypochlorite, irritating to eyes and skin. Warning, do not use with other products. Avoid contact with skin and eyes. In case of contact with eyes, rinse immediately with plenty of water and seek medical advice. Plenty to say there about sentencing and how it connects to the context and the meaning. First of all, contains sodium hypochlorite. Look, this is elliptical. It's a minor sentence that we've got here. So it's a minor sentence, declarative, and it's using a minor sentence because it has to communicate information quickly and efficiently. It's on a bottle of bleach. You're not going to be spending half an hour reading the label on a bottle of bleach. So it needs to communicate its message very quickly to the implied reader. Secondly, it's here we've got warning. So we've got an exclamative. And so it's a non-standard exclamative. And this conveys an the importance of the message because we're talking about bleach here and if it's misused there are possibly life-threatening consequences so that's why we have that short sentence 
Avoid contact with skin and eyes. We've got imperatives. We've got the main verbs that the sentence starts. And so this strongly gives us a sense of authority. So it's not a mitigated uh, imperative like, it might be a good idea to avoid contact with skin and eyes, which sounds too uh, a bit wet and it's, it's too indirect. Okay, so we've got direct imperatives there, which show that the people who are uh, producing the bleach and producing the labels, they have power in this particular uh, situation. And then finally, in the case of contact with eyes, rinse immediately with plenty of water and seek medical advice. Now here you've got a complex sentence. It's actually a complex imperative sentence because it's warning the reader of action in certain circumstances. Now it's important that the company do this because if there's some terrible accident where a child picks up the bleach and starts rubbing their eyes, and obviously ends up being hospitalized, then the manufacturers of the bleach can say, well, we did put a warning on here, you know, in the case of contact with eyes, which is a conditional subordinate clause. Okay, so the, there are things to say about the sentence forms here, which link in directly to the messages and um, to the meanings. Right, so there are a number of, if you're in my class, you'll have got a, a photocopy here with uh, some various short texts in which sentencing we is important. We, so we've got Winston Churchill in 1940 on the radio saying, we shall go on to the end. We shall fight them in France. So there's interesting things to uh, say there about the sentencing. We've got an advertisement for a cruise holiday. Oh, I could do with one of those. Join a voyage through the Far East and uncover spectacular cities. And then we've got another one, which is from the Beano, uh, from my son's Beano. Are you in the Beano Club yet? Only £12 a year and you get a fab welcome pack. So what you need to be doing is annotating closely some of the sentence forms and effects that are going on there. And the key thing is always to link it in to the context and the meanings. Don't just simply uh, spot the features. When you've done all of that, give yourself a bit of trump because there's a fantastic little video here about how Trump answers questions. And uh, a lot of the detail here is about his sentence forms. So what better way to finish an English extra sentencing session than to have a little bit of Donald? Okay, thank you, that'll do for today.